Were we starting? <laughs> I thought we were just gonna go into it. Yeah, but you gotta indi indicate, like, are we going into it? Uh, oh, I guess we're into it now. Yeah, we're into it, we're into it. Hey, Kevin. Okay. Oh. What up, Albert? Nothing much. What did you think of the last session? Session 43. Session 43. I think the first um, two hours, two and a two and bit hours was really fun, and then it just kind of dragged a little bit more towards the end. Overall, I was really, really happy with uh, how that session went. Because I was comparing it to the amount of time I spent actually preparing for the session. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I got my efficiency value up. I don't know, I enjoyed it. What did you think? Yeah, I thought the I thought the first part was pretty cool. I like the concept. It was like kind of like glorified railroading, but I I still liked it. It was like cool in a narrative way. Yeah, I mean, if you, you it's it's only railroading if the events actually occur into the. Actually, we should probably talk about what we're talking about, right? Context wise. Yeah. So let's let's just jump off into the recap. The recap. So, Basically, our party finishes talking with Ed Warren, one of the primes and the head of the College of Huria. That's the one. Which is some sort of, yeah, magical college. He's like a Luxodon. And he tells us where to find um, a book about this ancient weapon called the Oathbreaker. And it's in this specific section of the library that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and we managed to grab hold of the book which kind of had a mind of its own like it was trying to get away from us but um my character snow managed to snatch it up using his his serpent form technique um and yeah. then um yeah and then we opened the book um or well, had to hold it down basically and uh basically we started reading it and all of a sudden the the book starts drawing us in with this magical power um, I believe Eisen was like the only one who was able to read the words because they seemed to be like gibberish that was like changing back and forth yep. Yep. into different forms, um, which I like, by the way, that's kind of, um, that's kind of reminiscent to what the concept of Elder Scrolls are in the Elder, Elder Scrolls series. That's magic, baby. That, it's like, yeah, it's like an unknowable thing. And it's got a mind of its own and you don't really know like what they're there for things like that but let's put it here we knew what this book was here for um do you want to read out what the book was called the title Ooh. and the author it was called Actually, you might, the you might read the entire reference. oh should we i'm fine with that okay well i don't have it up in front of me so give me a second but the um i believe it was called the third alignment by River Most Tranquil. And here, I got it in front of me. Let's let's hit it up. So the party just kind of opens this book. Um, and then I make them do a wisdom saving throw. And I had the DC set pretty high in my mind. It was at least 20, maybe 25. Um, and everyone, <laughs> everyone rolled absolute garbage on theirs, with the exception of Aizen, who got a 24. So she was, she kind of kept, was kept outside the book as everyone else was kind of uh, spirited away, spirited into the book itself, and when they kind of, um, woke up, they assumed the bodies of, how do I explain this? They, the, the, yeah. Like, like an alternate future self, so basically the book is set three months in the future, in an alternate timeline, so the parties assume themselves, but it's three months in the future in a different timeline, or you could say the future itself, but there's some clues that allude to that. Like, it's just like an, like a separate timeline. Yeah. Um, basically, um, also I, I want to note that Rivermost Tranquil, um, if anyone remembers, um, Lewis's character's name is, is Tranquil Storm. There's a similarity there and it's not for no reason. So we'll, we'll probably touch on that later, but, um, where our future selves, it's three months into the future. Apparently, the party has gone through all this stuff and have made it to the chamber just before uh, where the Oathbreaker is kept. Yeah. And basically, like, we've been fighting for however long. I think you made us, you know, use up. You made us, like, say, okay, you <laughs> no longer have these spell slots, these spell slots. You're also at half health and at third level of exhaustion. So 
been through hell at, up at, until this point. Yep. Um, there was another caveat as well. Not not a caveat, but Eisen wasn't sucked in, so um, she was outside kind of observing the book. But there was another character in the party who was also not sucked in the same as us, which was Ryan. And he his character... Um, contrary to the rest of the party that got sucked in, appeared to be like his mind has no recollection of like getting sucked into the book because all the characters that got sucked in the book, like they just got put there. There's no context for what happened, and we're kind of like picking up the pieces when we go. But Hell yeah! It seems like Ryan was like he'd already been there. His character is like, you know, how do I explain this? He's like um, privy to everything before like he wasn't sucked in the same way the party was yeah, sucked th- in this this ryan is just ryan who has experienced everything in the past three months yeah it's like pre-existing ryan i don't know how to explain it properly without yeah it, it's the future version of ryan except as being role played by the player himself so i pretty much had to give uh the player the information that the, the rest of the party was missing so it was a really fun dynamic to play with hmm Basically, we're in this room, and, like, a couple demons come down, and we fight the demons, and then, you know, the first round of the turn ends, and then all of a sudden, you say, um, you know, there's words that start appearing in our heads, and basically, the text dictates what happens next, so Storm kills one of the demons with a poisonous knife, and the other one, you know, dies under a collapsing roof. And we figured out that, okay, we have to recreate what the text just dictated to us in order to proceed. Yeah. And then after some uh, dickery, we managed to do that. (laughs) And then, you know, the the text kept appearing and it kept describing these events. Like, then this figure, the scourge of the sands appeared. Some some villain that um, current timeline party hasn't met yet, but... um, in this timeline, they apparently they have, and um, he's this lich or something like that that's been hunting the party, and um, and then uh, I think he summons more demons or something like that. Yeah, he came with more demons. Yeah, yeah he came with more demons, right? So basically, just just before he came, the the party came together, and there was like a line from the text saying, you know, they gathered together for a discussion. Little did they know that this would be their last discussion <laughs> they would have as a full party or something like that. Yeah. And um, all these demons came and then one of these, one of the Balgurus that came down afterwards was like, oh my, well, well Shindedu and fucking yeeted s- snow <laughs> out of the picture. <laughs> yeah, it was a, um, uh, God, I think the names are so confusing. It's like a Net- Nalfashin or something. They're these big, um kind of pig-faced creatures with small, like, black wings on their back, and they are able to kind of teleport around. And, um, it was really funny, because, um, actually, I'll, I'll go back first. So, as the party were kind of recreating the events, I was really, really happy with how, um, like, once you figured out that you kind of have to recreate the events, that you just kind of jumped on to the next thing straight away. Like, because I remember sending the next bit of text, which was, um, who was it? Was it? It was... Like, an argument kind of blows up between the party. And Storm just... Uh, Lewis's character just straight up jumped onto it. He just started arguing back and forth with uh, future Ryan, who is absolutely confused. And then the next speed of text comes up, and it's uh, Snow has to argue with Tokel. And <laughs> I don't know if it was if it was just me, but that seemed, like, really realistic. <laughs> well, what was it for you, Kevin? <laughs> What do you mean, like, realistic how? As like in, it like, felt natural it felt like you were, to do. you were uh, letting loose your true feelings, uh, even though it was just something you had to do. Do you understand what I mean there? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy, because it's something Snow has done before, and it probably would be something that he would berate Tokel with. And I think... It kind of, it seems slightly out of character, but now that I think about it, given the circumstances we've been fighting for like three or four days straight without rest, and we've probably been in like heaps of fucked situations because of what Tokel did. Yep. So it was probably 
yeah, like snow was at his breaking point. Um, I guess, but it, it was, there's, there's a bit of like, there's a bit of a disconnect between like, because snow just got plopped into this situation and then like, he's picking up all the pieces and then the text says he has to do this. It's like, I like to think of it as like all of a sudden, like snow for that instance, he becomes the snow of that timeline. Uh. Like, he's no longer like just plopped in there. He like, he becomes the, the proper snow that like, like Ryan is in that time. Like, he's becomes pre-existing. Right. And then I'm like, oh, I realize, fuck you, Toku, it's all your fault. <laughs> Something like that. And then, you know, as the text dissipates, then you, you kind of settle down. Yeah. On a side note, was that cathartic at all to you? Being able to let loose a barrage of insults at your fellow party members? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to that because... Yeah, I don't know. Because it, again, going back to the disconnect, it wasn't actually... It wasn't real. Yeah, it wasn't real, it wasn't right? real. So, not really. But if they're, like, if they're, if that was, like, the real thing, like, that was the proper timeline, no goofy book stuff, like, we had actually gone through all of that stuff, then, yeah, maybe. Maybe there would have been. Okay. But... Yeah. Obviously, just because, again, we were told to do that, so we did do it, but, yeah, you know, yeah. Man, like, as I was sending those um those messages, and I have this whole thing pre-written, I, w- I was looking at, I was just kind of listening to how the party was already interacting, so uh, Snow had an argument with Tokul, and Oasis intervenes, in, like, on, on behalf of Tokul, and I, I didn't send the message, but Oasis was already doing it by the time I yeah. sent the message, I was like, wait, wait, what's going on? <laughs> Am I a prophet? What's going on? I don't know, it was really weird and telling. And the same thing happens, going back to the, the Nalfashin, or whatever it's called, that teleports into the room. And Snow, b- being the first one to jump in between the uh, the monster and the the artificer. Oh, yeah, we didn't even mention that there... So, in addition to the party that was there, there were two other NPCs that were with us in the, the chamber of the Oathbreaker, or the chamber just before that. Yeah. Um, so there was the Artificer Eliwick, which, uh, is one of Eliwick. two Artificers we, we meet, we meet in this session and a, another character who has been mentioned before, Igmar, um, you would remember that Storm paid off his fees in the last session at the college. Um, so for some reason they're with us, um, and we're trying to protect Eliwick because she's figuring out some uh lock on a magical door yeah. to the oathbreaker itself and we have to buy her some time um in order to do so i don't know what igma was doing there like it wasn't clear what he was there for yeah. but yeah clearly he he was with us for some time um and yeah and then um ryan had some like had said some stuff like you don't remember this happening here you know at the dragon horde and then this happened and this happened and then you know storm was very like he was very on the boat where he's like i just got here tell me everything tell me i kind of i kind of wanted to like pretend that i knew the context but um but i did i did ask you like so the party members don't have any context and you said no so i was like okay yeah so for you guys specifically you guys uh, were actually kind of popped into that situation with no context yeah I just, I just wanted to do that because I like doing a bit of improv and just kind of making some stuff up on the fly. But <laughs> I'm just here to shoot. <laughs> oh god, that was funny. That was funny because I think that line came up because Storm read the part where he's like, Storm has to kill the Balgura with a poisonous blade, and then Storm turned to Snow first, and he was like, "You're gonna help me, right?" And I was like, "Sorry, Storm." I only know how to shoot. <laughs> <I kept>... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a great interaction. Anyway, you die. <laughs> you die. Anyway, I get, I get fucking, um, I get fucking fisted of the North Star. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yeah. So basically the text read that snow was the first to slip or fall or die, something like that. Um, and he, he imparts some last words to Igmar and Eliwick. Um, and Snow basically grabbed a piece of paper 
out from his uh, pocket and and put it in her hand. Oh, that was a letter, wasn't it? Was it? The letter to... It was, it was paper. I didn't say it was a letter. It was a paper. Though. Yeah, but the thing you sent me after the session, was that, was that the same thing? No, actually, okay. Okay. I... It was the design for Craig ah. Design, but I never, I never specifically said as such. I thought maybe you would have picked that up when I actually gave the design to no, I had no idea. the other art, other oh, art oh, advisor, yeah, because I, I, I said, I feel my chest and feel the paper is still there, and then I pull it out. I must have missed so that, because I thought you were picking up just stuff from the ground at that point. Oh, is that why you made? Yeah, okay, never yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll, we'll get. To get that. Sorry, we'll get to that. Should I? Should I read through the um, the the book? Yeah, go for the, it. The excerpt. Yeah, it. All right, this might take a little while, but let's go. So this is by the Misty Cliff Clan, Rivermost Tranquil. Excerpt from the Third Alignment, Hurian History, edited by Ed Warren, the College of Huria, Huria, the Al Hadaran Sands, twenty four AC, pages five thousand nine hundred thirty two to five thousand nine hundred thirty three. Caked in blood and viscera, the party met the latest of their demonic pursuers with tooth and fang. Their bodies exhausted from week-long chase, their resources scarce, no doubt still in shock from the recent betrayal. The latest foes breathed their last. A Balgura fell to the poison-coated blade of Storm, who then involuntarily bellowed out an advertisement to the Iron Maiden. The equally massive Dragloth cleverly barleyed under the loose debris that filled the ceiling. A brief reprieve from the seemingly endless onslaught that was granted. Yet instead of spending the time to collect their breaths, another argument exploded out between the party members. Not a rare occurrence after the horrible string of events that happened in the weeks prior. Snow, filled with disdain for his scaled companion, let loose a barrage of insults. For it was was his fault they had attracted the attention of the Cobalt Cutlass, and consequently the mercenary companies of Huria. If only he didn't let it slip that they travelled with a water genasi. Before Tokel could utter, utter out a response, Oasis moved to defuse the situation. Their young gnomish artificer Eliwick continued to puzzle together the glyphs littering the surface of the massive vault door, her flank guarded closely by their ship's captain, Igma. His clothes drenched in blood, face tinted in unhealthy white, and hand resting on the claw-shaped gash stretching across his abdomen. Eisen could be heard nearby, reprimanding Storm. I told you. I told you this would happen if you stole the damn airship. No, it'd be like, I told you. I told you this would happen if you stole the damn airship. The two began to bicker, volume rising with the blood-soaked chamber. Maple and Ryan rested by an open tomb of the previously defeated mummy. Their small talk, no doubt, about the past few weeks' events. The party joined together for a discussion. Little did they know it'd be the last they would ever have as a party. Time was running out. It wouldn't be long until another batch of the demon's minions arrived on site. And arrived they did. The party fought fought valiantly, as they bought time for Eliwick to decipher the glyphs. But time is not cheap. Snow was the first to fall. His last words imparted to Igmar and Eliwick before standing between them and Nalfishni. He traded blow for blow with the towering beast before succumbing to its terrible talons. Tokel was next. In a blaze of holy radiance, he sought vengeance for his fallen friend. His flail, reforged by the master's smithies of the teapot, and blessed in radiant white light, found purchase in the neck of the beast. But then the night, but then the light was snuffed out by the single utterance of an ancient word that reverberated through the chamber. For he had arrived. The ever-present shadow pursuing the party, the undying scourge of the sands. Sivgus, the defiler, dra- Draped in ruined vestments, the lich moved to claim another life from the party. Sivgus pointed one bony finger toward the battered druid. Negative energy flowed through her body before she crumpled to the floor, only to be resurrected in an instant, a slave to undeath. The chamber began to shudder when Eliwick deciphered the vault. The remnants of the party managing to scramble through closed the massive vault door behind them. The silence was unsettling, only to be broken after a few moments by Eliwick's tears. Eisen, Storm, Ryan, Maple, Igmar, Eliwick, and the Oathbreaker sit upon a pedestal of gold, their key to freedom paid for in blood. And there's this little uh, note at the bottom that says, The true appearance of the Oathbreaker is still unknown to this day. 
Father never never deigned to describe it, nor its terrible true power. So that was that was really fun to write that. I honestly had mm. no idea how it was going to go, but a lot of stuff just kind of fell in place. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the kind of... Well, it was definitely forced deaths, but what, what did you think of the deaths? Again, it's like... It was kind of like a cool way to railroad. Not that I have a particular problem with that. It was like a cool narrative way. Like, this is obviously like a cautionary tale, right? That the party should take. Yeah. Because certain events could lead up to these moments and some of us could die. But obviously, they did, at the same time, they were, they were forced deaths. Like, it's so... It's pretty unlikely, like, three party members just end up dead, just like that. Well, um, uh, me realistically. mechanically, power word kill would actually just insta-kill total. No, 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 I understand, I understand. But for three people to suddenly die like that, I don't think that would happen. I think people would, like, die one by one as we went through whatever we went through. Yeah, okay. Um, so... I'll be realistic, it is just a tortionary tale, and I, I take it as such. Perhaps you know? it's just fiction. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? What did you think about the little part after that? Where they're just in the vault, the door closes behind them, and they're just kind of left to themselves. Yeah, I think it's I think it's cool. I liked the part where, like, you know, it was just silence until there was only tears or something like that. I thought that was pretty poetic, but... Um, I liked that you left that open-ended. Uh, I think that was a good stopping point for all of that. What I did like the most was the historic tidbit at the end, where he said, Father never deigned to describe the true form of the Oathbreaker. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, what was it? it was called? River, River, River Tran Most Tranquil. Tranquil. River Most Tranquil is probably Storm's son in another timeline. Who knows? Actually, this this is actually this whole sequence is also pretty reminiscent of what an Elder Scroll actually does in the Elder Scroll series. Because basically the Elder Scroll has the past and the future. At the same time, they tell the past and the future events, but they they change, right? They change depending on what happens. They just say what could happen right yeah they give you a slice of the future so i think that was cool even though you didn't take inspiration for it because you're not an elder scrolls nerd like me but <laughs> uh, yeah the parallels are pretty succinct i did take inspiration from a different source but i shouldn't mention it that's fine that's fine so that was the end of the book section and then we all get warped back into reality or yeah. the current timeline i guess did did, and... did you feel what I was feeling when um when so when they when they when the book kind of ended the remaining party members started to like kind of phase out of existence and kind of shimmer away and did you did you kind of feel the reactions of the rest of the like the people left behind was that was that realistic at all to you or was it just like eh so like Eliwick kind of breaks down like yo what's what's going on Igmar's confused Ryan is just confused as well uh aizen <laughs> aizen's last words to storm was so snarky like you're choosing to run now <laughs> jesus mm, yeah to be honest i didn't pick up on that it was just kind of like extra flavor yeah it was just felt like flavor but what what so you you how, how did you feel about that i don't know i was it was um because ryan and aizen they were the the future version of themselves at that point so they were they were in, they were reacting as if you guys just kind of yeah, vanished yeah. into thin air, um, pre existing, yeah, yeah. And Eliwick, you guys don't know her at all, but she seems to have developed somewhat of a close bond to you guys. She 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 she, she like kind of grabs up to your legs. She gets close. She kind of hides behind you guys. Um, and there's that weird, I don't know, like a distinction between. Well, she knows us, but we have no idea who this chick is. But she seems like she's close to us, and she cried for when we died. So, do you think that's motivation to kind of meet her later on, or is that just like a eh? Fuck, fuck, fuck this bitch. Who's she? Um. All I could say is it's this book is a is a 
a slice of possibility of what could happen. Yeah. And the party is already changing stuff or trying to change stuff so the events aren't recreated. Just particularly the character deaths that happened there. Not not anything else, I would probably say. I don't think... Uh, I'll give you an honest opinion. I don't think many of the party members have given this much thought. Um, they may now after listening to the podcast, but I certainly didn't give it much thought until now. But I definitely... Definitely, Eliwick is definitely a character we could potentially meet, depending on, you know, how we do things. Uh, and we haven't even met Igma before. He's he's just a mentioned character at this point. So anything is possible. Anything is possible. It's just that, again, we have no context for that entire scenario. And I think the reaction is natural. Like, obviously, you're not going to, like... You're not going to suddenly develop all these, you know, feelings for a character when you've literally just met them. You know, you just met them. Can I have a counterpoint? At this point in time? Huh? Uh, yeah. Maple, as as he, as he was kind of shimmering away, he did say that um, he'd find he'd find a he'd find Eliwick as as he faded from existence. So I'd say there was some kind of attachment. Yeah, maybe maybe, maybe some of the party members. Um, uh, for me, no. Um, although it might have been not because I wasn't paying attention, it was just like my mind was in another place and I was my character literally died just before <laughs> that. So um and then yeah. I don't know. It's mixed mixed opinions, I think. Obviously I don't blame players who don't feel much for the character um when they just met him. Um it just really depends on how the player a particular player character interacts with a character sometimes like it just clicks right and you make a connection straight away and sometimes you don't make a connection until way down the line after you've been through so much you know so that i mean that's natural that's how human relationships work in real life something it's just sometimes it clicks sometimes it doesn't yeah yeah i agree i agree with that so what was the party's reaction after they escaped the book oh like i believe for st- Storm, like, unfazed, basically. Unfazed. Um, I tried to lean more into Snow would be pretty shaken to have experienced death a second time. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. Uh, and I tried to play into that a little more. I didn't get many opportunities to, like, really play into that. And I feel like the other players were just following suit after I mentioned that snow was shaken and they all kind of copied my answer, but that's fine really. And then they, they never touched on it again. Um, well, neither did I for that matter, but I've like, yeah, I, I tried to stay quiet because like, yeah, he was like, cause in my head I was thinking snow would be thinking like, you know, it's so easy to, to die. Right. And he was just thinking about what's his purpose. And then that's how I got the idea to write the letter I wrote to you post session. Yes, yes. Because I was intending to write a letter back to the prince after getting the letter, that other letter that he sent to me yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just didn't know how what to really say in that letter. Um, but yeah, um, basically, he's alive when he should be dead. But what is he alive for, you know? Um, is it just to die again is that really all he's here for or is it or is it some bigger bigger purpose you know if he can just die like anyone else then you know maybe 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 destiny is fake so he's just coming to terms with his own mortality right now yeah i guess his his uh his undeath i guess the fragility uh, of his existence something like that i don't, know. I don't uh, entirely agree with the party uh, with Oasis and Tokel being silent after that. I know Oasis was very adamant in never meeting another Prime because she, because she's she's fearing for her death. And I'm pretty sure Igma mentioned that one of the Primes um, was after you guys in, in that alternate timeline or whatever. So there's definitely there's definitely after effects of of, of death that you can hey, see. You just- you just said a spoiler. You just said a spoiler. I didn't say shit. You, 
Did you just mention that there was a prime after us? Yeah, Igma said it. In the in this, oh, did he? Yeah, you mentioned oh, wait, it. He did. Yeah, he did. He did. He did. Okay. He mentioned a lot of other things, which which might come into play. Wink, 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 wink. What do you think? Mm-hmm. What do you think about that as a storytelling device? Is it too railroady, or is it like a very interesting way to go about it? It's only it's only railroad if you force it to happen. That's all. If the if the party's decisions lead up to that point, then sure. Um, but if they don't, then they don't. So it's not. It's only railroad if you force it to be that way. Well, in in the context of going into that book and seeing the potential future for yourselves, what do you think about that as a storytelling device? Oh, I think I already mentioned that it's it's a cool way to like, it's like a what if scenario. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're, we're, we're reliving a what if scenario. So I think it's cool. It's like, it's like a story. Like, it's like any other story, like, you know, exploring what could happen if, if we had made these certain decisions and things like that. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. I thought that that whole sequence was pretty imaginative. It was, it was definitely, uh, different from usual. Um, do you think the party would is ever going to chase the clues that were kind of left behind in that in that whole sequence, like the dragon's horde or or the prime or the because because the betrayal of passage come, came up a lot after that. Yeah, well, I think most of the party was under the idea that this big betrayal is what set in motion what happened, the events that ha- occur afterwards, leading yeah. to the character deaths and all of that. Yeah, and us, you know, fighting for four days straight or whatever however long it is um so yeah the party is definitely on edge because of that and then take actions to to try and prevent that that's just a normal that's just a normal thing that anyone would do yeah okay i uh you mentioned that storm seemed unfazed by the whole experience i don't necessarily agree with that I mean, he, he was that? he was definitely very upset that, that people kept accusing him of stealing an airship in a potential future future and then he the fact that that is the only thing he's concerned about leads me to think that he is unfazed i mean there was also the the whole cobalt cutlass thing where he's like why, why are you putting all the blame on me it turned like a lot of that was tokel's fault as well and then there was that whole little discussion with tokel saying that um well i didn't i didn't i didn't mean i didn't mean any harm when i told them we were going running around with a water genasi i thought they were family i thought i could trust them and then there was that whole debacle and eisen got really angry at at tokul and then they had an argument and then there was a really nice moment where they apologized to each other that was kind of hard touching obviously harping on the events that lead up to what happened is is valid but i think in my opinion, and feel free to disagree, you'd be most shaken about the the party that you're with, members actually losing their lives because of all of this. And I don't, I get what you're saying. He was concerned about being blamed for certain things, but I think that like he, he was only concerned that he was being put on trial for something he didn't do. I don't think he was concerned that uh, and maybe maybe the player was, but from what the character said in the session, it was he was only concerned that he was the one being blamed, not that people ended up dying, right? Yeah, I mean to be fair, like you mentioned before, neither like none of the three who actually died really mentioned it much afterwards after after the fact. So maybe it wasn't as a powerful experience as as it, as it could have been or as it should have been maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. It's still it's still a big deal either way that, you know, stuff could get you killed. And I don't think any of the party has has had the proper experience of their decisions leading to someone's death. So I reckon if that had happened in an earlier session, like someone had died because of some decision was made, they'd probably take this more seriously. There are there are maybe one or two kind of experiences like that. I mean, um, Cragen did send the letter where he said, by the way, that, that town you guys went to, it's completely fucked up now. Like, 
his dragon came through and it's tore look, it up. There is, it's different. That is different. Is it? As it is black and white from an actual party member, an actual human being behind a character dying, than a bunch of NPCs. I'm sorry, it's different. It's different. It's way different. I thought we were just talking about the consequences of our actions. And when you said someone was No, dying, no, no, no. I'm talking about, like, actually a party member dying. Like, specifically oh, well, a party member dying. Oh, none of you experienced that. Yeah. That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that, yeah. They, they haven't gone so, through, through the motions. Yeah. Obviously, if that had happened before, then they'd probably take this more seriously. And I would take it more seriously as well, because I haven't truly... Um experienced like a proper main campaign death i mean i've experienced character deaths before or maybe one but that was like a one shot so and nobody you know one shots are pretty low commitment it's all it's the high commitment stuff that you should be scared of yeah yeah i agree with that i agree with that okay so um so what so basically we go back to edwarren and he he was like hey it asked us how it went and he was like yeah i hope you guys found what you were looking for and told us to go away which we did and i think i think the rest of the session was pretty uneventful barring stuff happening at the very end i think like just fast forwarding we all meet back at the tavern you know we kind of discuss what we want to do you know we should probably not leave oasis alone actually split up toko and oasis because they're troublemakers um uh and then we have like you know we, the party splits up once uh, one part of i think snow eisen and oasis stay at the tavern and then uh the other four maple ryan tokel and storm go to shopping. the market for, for a bit of a shopping sequence and yeah that's that's when the session drags a little bit because it's just shopping basically there are like some quest leads there, like the the short and stout thing. They like I think Tokul comes. They come up to a smithy called the Teapot, which was alluded to in the um in the events prior. Yeah, the, the book, the third alignment events. So like, there's already some pieces falling into place. You know, fulfilling the predestination. Um, and you know, some stuff happens there. Um. If you, you want to recap what exactly happens there, I'm a bit fuzzy on those sure. details. Um, before I do that, I want to I want I really want to compliment the party on the um discussion they have beforehand on on what what to do next because I think if I'm recalling correctly, most of that was actually done in character. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the players are finally being a bit more comfortable actually role playing actually i wanted to note i forgot to note it until now uh ryan's role play as future ryan was really good like i felt like he wasn't just speaking as aiden with a russian accent he was actually like a different character That's ryan. like he spoke he spoke differently like it was like it was actually a different character like like the true Ryan. And I hope that I hope that he keeps evolving that Final because form. that it felt it felt really authentic. It felt really authentic. He had like some snappy lines. They were like they didn't feel forced or anything like that. It just felt natural and yeah. great. Yeah. I was I was really happy with that as well. I think beforehand I was like, this, this is your time to shine. And he, he did. That was great. I really enjoyed that. Um yeah, like the whole party at this point is kind of talking in character, and I never thought I'd see the day. But it, it's happening. It's happening. And it's such a weird minor thing, but I'm so happy about it. I love the moments where, as the DM, the I can just sit back and just watch the party talk to each other in person and I don't have to do a single fucking thing. Those are the best moments for me. Oh, yeah, I think so you mentioned that before. I don't know yeah. if you've mentioned that. Probably not in the podcast, podcast now. Yeah, but yeah, you have said you have said that before. And I think that's great too, because you can just like you just relax, you know? Because being DM is taxing because most of the time players are talking to NPCs. So you got to be, you got to be on call all the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, there are some moments where you can have a bit of peace and quiet while the party chatters yeah. on. I mean, it's, it's not just, it's not just the, the workload being lessened. It's that I don't, as DM, I don't have to kind of motivate the characters to speak in character 
anymore. Like I don't have to be an NPC to evoke the the voices out of out of their characters or to make them think like the, they are their characters. They can just kind of do that to each other now, which is which is crazy to me. Which is great. I, I really that that's the main part for me, really. So I'm I'm not I'm not the driving the driving motivation anymore. It's it's you guys. Yeah, which is like the end goal. Yeah, that you should strive. That's for. the dream. That's the dream. Yeah. So I think it's only upwards from here. I hope I hope some of the characters adopt some more distinct voices but i think getting getting comfortable <laughs> with actually role playing is is the number one priority and i'm happy that that we are heading towards that direction we so. can we can talk about the the voice thing a bit later but um i'll talk about the shopping sequence i definitely um i tried to uh what's the word integrate the the changes we talked about in a previous previous podcast where mm-hmm. we just kind of skip over the the whole shopping thing yep I did notice you tried to do that in some places, yeah. Yeah, like um, uh, Tokel, I, I was just like, I he, the, the people selling bags of bags of diamonds. Here you go, or Magic Crystal. Just tell me what you want. Here you go, and I just kind of left. I just kind of left those out because it was definitely, it was definitely the, the kind of dead spaces you were talking about where it doesn't really add anything to the narrative if I were to be a shopkeeper, unless mm. it, like it, unless it's like a relevant plot point such yeah. as the teapot, which was. Which is, will come back into play maybe later, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, that was so they just buy the stuff. They they get the the desert costumes, the the desert sets. The the unlockable Hurian outfits was a bit of a meme we got going on. And y'all looking pretty stylish from the the images I saw, honestly. Yeah, I like I like that everyone is like I like that you're encouraging like, hey, just look up an image that you want your character to look like, and then we'll we'll consider it canon. I think that is like one of the number one things have being a dm is it it actually if you say something is so then it automatically becomes grounded in the player's mind at least for me right like as if i say it didn't really become like i remember first mentioning that um uh, like maybe seven sessions ago i want to change snow's outfit to like a more deserty one it wasn't really acknowledged until maybe two or three sessions ago and then finally when i posted up and you're like okay snow looks like you're like yeah snow looks like that now i was like okay now i'm really like yeah uh, i've really unlocked my outfit <laughs> and there, there was like a chain reaction where everyone was like oh snap snow's looking kind of kind of kind of cool looking and now everyone's kind of going into their own little outfit um, but yeah i think thing. you should definitely encourage like and this is more like just like something i'm saying to you as some advice like you shouldn't like if players want to like look some way i think it helps a lot if you acknowledge it as the dm and sometimes refer back to i know it's like another thing to remember but if the player reminds you or something like that you're like yeah you know he looks at your desert clothes and stuff it it helps them be immersed and they they actually look like that instead of you know yeah i agree with that i definitely agree with that yeah yeah um, after that, there was this kind of side bit where Passage shows up to the other three, <laughs> and this is, like, right after they're like, we can't trust Passage, we can't talk to Passage right now. Yeah, he comes to the tavern after we, we have this huge discussion, like, yeah, let's just never talk to Passage again. And then he comes, comes back like a crazy ex, and he's like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just, like, cold shouldering him, and then... Eisen was like going to do the same, but then Oasis was like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's 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 talk to this guy <laughs> some more." I'm like, "No, no, we can't do this." Oh, that was that was fun. Um, and then you guys did stick to the majority decision to not bring him in until you guys were ready. I think Eisen made a good point that like, and this I think it's pivotal what she said is that basically the party is coming to terms with and this goes back into the consequences of things the, the things the things that you decide to do have consequences actually maybe the, the the book sequence was actually pretty effective in that way on a on a more subtle level right on a more subconscious level yeah um and she said like yeah you shouldn't you shouldn't be just doing stuff on your own especially against the party's will we've all clearly stated 
we don't want to talk to Passage anymore. And then you clearly invite him to interact with the party more. And I was like, damn, that's a good point. Yeah, you should get the party's consent first before you try and fuck us all over. Looking at you, Storm. Looking at you. Ooh. And um, I was like, yeah, that was... I was like, I was really impressed with the argument that she made there. And I was like, yeah, this is like a whole new level now. You can't just fuck around and do whatever you want. I mean, that's, it's kind of like a, a, two, a two-edged blade, a two-sided blade, right? Because there, there, there's fun in being able to just kind of do what you want. But I think we are definitely moving in the direction where everything's getting a little more serious. The stakes are kind of being slowly raised. And this, Yeah, but it's like... Yeah. It's it's like obviously they can do whatever they want, and you would let them do whatever they want. You yes, with the DM, definitely. but this is strictly like player to player, right? Like in character. Like it's not like I'm not saying players aren't allowed to do whatever they want, but they they should be considering the other, the lives of the other characters in the party as well when they do stuff. Yeah, I'm not saying that you as the DM, you don't let them do stuff against the party. No, definitely not. Definitely You're not. free to do that. You're free I mean, to if, do they, that. if they want to fuck over the party, I'm 100% willing to go let them yeah, fuck yeah, over yeah. the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they have to deal with it. But the other party may not be so agreeable to that, to that in character. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with so, that. So, yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not saying play of freedom, go down the drain. I'm saying because you have play of freedom, you should use it wisely. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it definitely comes to a head in like the next, the next section where you guys go to the, um, the little, little fort at the base of the mountain where Oasis believes the her vision is. Where mm -hmm. God, you guys spent you guys spent a pretty long time just going back and forth on should we infiltrate this place? Should we not infiltrate this place? Should we go back yeah. talk to the council? So context. We come up to the base of the mountain and there's these two decked out guards, you know, looking looking professionally trained elite protecting this door. This magical door, right? And, um, at the base of the mountain. And they're like, you need, you need strict permission from the council in order to get past. And then after some bargaining storms, like, oh, you know, how much you would you need in order to, in order to let us pass as a bribe? And he's like, you know, he looks at the other guard and he's like, even if we were to let you pass, you'd still need the tokens in order to get through the door. And that was one of the times where I was like, oh yeah, yeah, cool. This card is not like. It's not letting, it's not shutting down Storm, but he's just saying it how it is. And I kind of like that. And so we, we come back out of earshot from the guard and some ideas get thrown around. How about we knock out the guards and how about we just sneak past the door or the wall somehow or like wild shape and we'll fly over someplace or you know, we just want to look at the wall. We just want to look at the door. Um... You know, we try and dispel the door. Storm wants to try and use the door as a... What, what was it? Uh, animate objects. Yeah, he was trying to animate the door, whatever it was. And mechanically, I was thinking in my head, in my meta head, right? In my meta mind, I was meta like, mind. none of this shit is going to work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> none of this shit is going to work. But obviously, I'm not going to shut down the conversation. I'm not going to block it. Okay? That's the, like, the, the big no-no in improv. No blocking. So I just kept my, myself quiet, but I put out there that we should just go back to the council and just do it the legit way. It, it might actually be easier than going through the trouble of failing, getting past the door any other way, and then potentially, you know, we all get a bounty on our heads because we disobeyed the council. We went against the council, the primes that run the city, and we all become like Oasis, and we could never enter Hurrier again. And I think... When I mentioned that, when I actually mentioned that, like, okay. So at first we voted, right? And it was, it was four, four to three vote, majority vote to try and sneak past the door somehow or try and get past the guards and get past the door somehow. Yeah. Um, and there was some plans being thrown around there. Again, I've already mentioned a few. And then I, I said a snow. Well, okay. Majority votes. We're trying to get past the door somehow. If we're doing this, we need a plan to, we need a plan in case we fail. And that's what kind of stumped the party a little bit because we didn't really have one. Eisen was under the impression that we'd just sneak in and we'd be able to get out undetected. 
and she made an argument that, you know, um, they would only find out if it was magically sealed, which we assumed most likely it was. We didn't know that, but we assumed that it was, um, being that this was something sealed that you would need strict permission from the council from. It, it, it's probably locked up tight. So, yeah, and then I, I hit them with the line, if we do this and fail and get caught, we all become fugitives, yeah. not just Oasis. Yeah. And that, and that, and everyone was like, oh shit. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. You're that, just reminding that, them of the consequences. Yeah. And then, then that, that kind of turned the, um, kind of turned the tables. So we did another vote. So I should mention who voted for what. So sure. in the first vote, I believe it was Maple, Storm, Oasis, and Eisen in favor of trying to sneak past the door. I think, no, I think, I think instead of Maple, it was Tokel, right? No, 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 Tokel. No, 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 no. It wasn't Tokel. Because no? I, I clearly remember Tokel saying he was concerned about getting caught and but what could happen. I also remember him saying we should knock the guards out. <laughs> but I think maybe that was after you decided to get. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that was it was after. Okay, we, okay. I believe that was after majority rules. So we would like just we went along with it. Okay, even even okay. Snow tried to go along with it for a little. That's why I said you know we need a plan if we're going to do this. And then after I'd said that. We did, okay, it was like, okay, new vote, <laughs> new vote. In the end, it was only, I think, I think maybe it was me saying that. And then Toko was like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we can try dispelling it, but it's only third level. And then Maple suggested this same thing, I think. Yeah, except at a higher version. At, at a higher version, but then he ultimately thought that that might not work either. And I think that, that was like the true turning point. And then was like, okay, new vote. And then Storm was like, "Yeah, let's not do this. I don't want to. I don't want to get fucked here." And then yeah, Maple was like, "Yep, I can't. I I'm not strong enough to do this. So I'm not doing it." <laughs> and then it was only in the end, it was only Eyes and an Oasis. Now Oasis, understandably, did not want to go to the council because of her uh, status as a fugitive, basically as a wanted woman, yeah. a wanted water genasi. Understandable that she would want to avoid seeing the council um but eisen just wanted to have a look and she seemed stubborn about doing that as well um regardless of the, the consequences i think again she had it in her head that we wouldn't get caught when in reality there, there was probably a big chance that we would what i disagreed with her most is that looking at the door wasn't as big of, of a risk than it was when I feel like it was a pretty ri big risk for something pretty low reward, you get my meaning. Yeah, but she she did make a point in that um, if if you guys do try and look look at the door and find out that it is super guarded, then regardless of how you interact with the council, they're not going to let you through anyway if they're guarding it this this hard. And I think that was her main motivation behind behind that. Um, true. Trying to sneak in. True. But also, we haven't even spoken to the council yet, so there's no yeah. way she'd know also, that for also sure. Also true. Also true. But yeah, that is true. And then I made the point that, obviously, the council was not going to just, like, even if we convince them to consider letting us through, they're not going to let us through for free. It's not going to be easy. Um, and we're going to end up having to do some stuff. But I also made the point, as Snow, that doing favors for the council might actually give us a little bit of actual like bonus favor with them because we you know we sorted out a problem for them so there was there was some benefit there um other than you know getting us through the door we might actually make some connections along the way that yeah. could help us later yeah. on so that's it was it was like a it was like kind of like a win lose you know lose because we have to do shit for the council and get in contact with them and possibly get into more trouble that way but win with the connections and the favor we get from the council, potentially, from doing the stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Long story short, all in favor, no. I mean, majority favored, voted no. So we decided, okay, well, um, what are we going to do now? Um, some p people were like, how about we just go to the council now? And and I believe in game time, it was getting pretty dark. It's around getting to sundown, yeah. Yeah, sundown. So it was getting pretty dark at this point. So, um, we're like considering splitting up again. Some of us were going to head to the Artificer, um, at the tail of Huria. 
uh, the gigantic turtle, which the city resides on. Hell yeah. And which was equidistant from the city itself, um, about three hours on foot. And then we're like, you know, we don't have to see the council now. We can, we can just go tomorrow. And uh, I was like, okay, let's just all go to the artificer. And then we, we, we meet the artificer. There, there, there's this conversation um, Storm tried to have with the rest of the party as you guys were walking to the artificer. And that was one of the, like, I was, I was cringing from, like, the outside, <laughs> from the outside in. Because Storm was like, um, what did he say? He's like, I got other things to do as well. Do you guys have anything else you, you, you need to do in the city? And everyone was just silent. I was like, oh, jeez. I, d- I did. <laughs> I did hear that. I didn't hear it the first time. And then I heard it when he tried to say it, repeat himself. And I tried to say, I have a letter to send. But someone spoke over, over me. So I think he didn't quite hear that. Yeah, the conversation died real quick when Oasis stormed off as a bird. I'm not sure if it was re- good roleplay or she's just so immersed that she was angry in person and angry in character as well. But yeah, she did She did not agree with um you know, the party's decision. Yeah, yeah, she had a bit of a sook. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely easy to be so immersed that character emotions translates to real life emotions. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th- I guess that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a good thing. Unless, unless you get too, you get too immersed, then maybe, maybe there's some issues. Yeah. If, if, okay. This one, it's one thing to like get immersed, right? It's another thing to start taking things personally, which is probably taking it too far. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I you're angry at the yep. players themselves for stuff that character is doing. Yeah. I don't think, um, I don't think we're ever going to run into that issue. I don't think. I think everyone yeah. in this party is pretty, pretty chill. Yeah, but I'm just saying there's a line between, like, immersion Definitely. and just, like, Definitely. taking it personally, so. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, obviously it's fine. And we, we managed to, we managed to win her over mentioning that she liked doing puzzles. Like, after the session ended, she was like, oh, I want to, I want to do some more puzzles. <laughs> and we're like, council <laughs> might have puzzles. <laughs> hey, there's, there's puzzles at the council. I mean, D&D, everything is pretty much a puzzle, right? Everything, everything's a problem that can be solved in a million different ways. So yeah, yeah, but uh, she's like, I want an actual puzzle, like a literal puzzle. DM, DM has to say this is a puzzle for it to be a puzzle. Yeah, maybe we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, as as they're walking to the artifices, they there's this giant shadow of a, of a winged creature that's breathing fire that passes over them. <laughs> you guys actually thought it was a dragon, huh? Yeah, it was like this me- mechanical dragon and. It lands, and it, it it was like this wooden, was it like a wooden dragon? Yeah, it's like a wooden dragon was with co- wings. It and was covered like in head. like these runes. I don't know if the runes part was just the the improv that Eisen was saying, but Eisen was like enthralled, but entranced by this thing. She was like, <gasps> she's she's got her head it, cannon. It, it it looks like it looks like an airship, and then she like turned all artificer and started like you know spewing out all this like technical stuff like you know if, if you change the runes here and it could boost the efficiency blah 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 all this stuff and then you know the guy the the artifice that we meet which is this this old gnome this old male gnome jumps out and he's like he's like a crazed he's like a crazed guy crazed hermit right and he's like jumping around he's like a little leprechaun you know and he's like it works it works <laughs> <laughs> maybe like that but um <laughs> um but yeah he's like He's like this crazed inventor, right? And um, yeah, Eisen has has a similar sense of enthusiasm about it. And like she's saying all this stuff, and he's is he's the guy is like she's just stroking his ego, and he's like he's just like soaking it all up, all the all the all the all the stuff, right? But I think you mentioned that like he's not really listening to her. He's just like yeah, he's just stroking his own ego. Yeah, he's a bit of a- um. Hey, do, you wanna, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to describe this character? What yeah, I don't think I actually got into his physical description, other than that he's a short gnome. <laughs> um, I'll pull up. I'll pull up the description right now, actually. But from what I can recall, he's very um, he's very disheveled most of the time. He's he's covered in oil stains. He's got these like a large pair of goggles on his head. He's got these um, kind of like shriveled pink, like dark pink hair. And if you guys recall, the 
Uh, Ellie Wick had a uh, pink hair as well. Uh, just, just saying, just saying, just saying. Yeah, well, I, I know, I would we probably have a good idea that Ellie Wick is related because you did mention that there was another artificer in Denethar somewhere, like in a capital or something like that. Yeah, but so, and and you you mentioned that it was a woman, so yeah, it was safe to assume that that was her. Maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah, he's, he has this giant kind of smile on his face. What I didn't get to describe, which I'm going to say because he was wearing a pair of pants, that he actually has uh, prosthetic legs. But oh. I, did, I didn't get to that part yet. So maybe, Man, maybe later big, on. That's a, big, that's a big point. You should that have is a big that point, out. yeah. That is a big point. Which is why we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it at the start of next they're like They're like pogo sticks. Like he's like bouncing around like on little pogo sticks. No, they're like <laughs> actual, uh, actual replacements for legs. He's got feet and... And like the literal limbs that that work, and I'll I'll have to exact because I know Eisen will ask. I'll have to explain the the magical uh, engineering behind it when when, well, when she does ask. That prosthetic leg bit that would have been pretty poignant to point out when I when Snow whipped out the design for the prosthetic arm, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that at that point, relevant. I w- <laughs> I think it just slipped my head. I slipped slipped over me. I was like, I just, I just completely forgot that this guy is also um, legless, legless, legless. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll probably just be a reveal at some point where he just kind of lifts up his 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 pant leg and he's like, yo, me too. Except in a more eccentric kind of voice. Yeah. So basically, he leads us back to. Oh well, he takes Eisen, or Eisen flies with him back to the place, and you know they get there sometime yeah. before him us. Him leading you back is generous i don't think he noticed you guys at, at all no 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 he just left sorry i yeah. i misspoke he, he just left and we just followed his direction right the direction he left in yeah storm summoned some horses and then we got there some time later like 20 minutes later after eisen did and we go inside this kind of oily garage you know makeshift workshop Type yeah, it's like on Did the you... inside of a massive uh, hull of a ship, pretty much of, of a wooden right, ship. Right. Okay. Like a like an actual like airship, like an. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Except it doesn't work. Wooden it's, airship. Yeah. 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 It's kind of broken I'm down imagine, into bits. I'm, yeah, I'm imagining one of those huge ships that you just shipwrecks you can find on the coast of Skyrim or something like that. Yeah, you can you can look at it like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we go inside. I don't think much happens. It's more it's more like Eisen kind of fanboying over like the cool designs and stuff and you were describing how like yeah, there's shit everywhere. There's papers everywhere. There's bits and bobs, nuts and bolts. You know, there's designs like all over the walls and crawling up the ceilings and things like that. And um most of the party doesn't really know what to think of this and basically um, after a while, like, Storm's like, okay, it's no, it's, 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 maybe, maybe it's time to give it to him. So I get out the piece of paper, and, and this is what I say the, the cue, right? Yeah, I this feel is where I misunderstand, yeah. I feel for the paper in, in the, the shirt pocket, and I, I pull it out, and for some reason, <laughs> he tries to, he tries to snatch it from me, and I guess this is where you un- misunderstood, right? Because yeah. you, you probably thought that Snow picked up a paper. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Floor. Um... And anyway, I put it on the table and um, he looks at it and he's like, this is a shit design. A shit design. <laughs> I was like, hey, hey, I've rolled, a, I've rolled a 20 for this. I rolled a 20. It's good. It's elegant. It's simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a bit of convincing you guys had to do to bring him over. But yeah, he, he was pretty much convinced that the design was absolute garbage. And he just kind of takes it off from you, your hands and just runs to a corner and starts scribbling over it. And the yeah, session like, ends there. Yeah. I like to think that um, because I rolled high, like I like to justify that design is not probably as intricate or cool looking, but it's like, it's functional. It's very functional, right? It's yeah. like probably, it's probably got like a normal amount of digits for the fingers and there's like little ball bearings for the joints and things. So, you know, you don't have to rely on hinges and things like that. And then there's some pulleys hitting, hidden under the arm and, you know, bits of rope here and there, like acting as the pulleys, like kind of like the, those prosthetic in Sekiro, like kind of like simple looking, but it's functional. It's very functional. 
Yeah, I think um, if you want to if you want to look at it like that, um, I think the the artificer body knock looks at it and he's like, "This is this is some old world garbage. We don't use pulleys or levers anymore. We use magic," which is why he was like, "This is this is absolute garbage," because he 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 dabbles in both engineering and and magic. Mm. So uh, he, you can assume he's like, "Okay, no, none of this none of this is relevant anymore. I can I can just have a replacement for it by using." using things we'll talk about when when the next session arrives um yeah i guess i guess that's like that's kind of a true statement but it kind of feels bad as a player that he's just like disregarding all this hard work that i put into this shit and it's just all getting thrown away yeah he's he's a bit of an asshole uh, i won't lie it's, 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 most eccentrics are kind of assholes um yeah that's where the session ends pretty much there are oh, a few other I things i want to talk about I hope we get some input on the design. Like, I don't want it. I don't want him to take over the project. I'll make sure Snow like doesn't let him take over the project. Okay, okay. It, it's my it's my design first. Okay, it's my it's my it's my, it's my idea. I I, 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 I made the He's design. Okay, it. He's gonna you, steal you don't, it. Get, you don't just get to the, like throw away and make it steal it. it. That is the, hey, you, you don't. It's my design. It just. It, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So you wanted to. Talk, you want to, you have some topics you wanted to talk yeah, about? Yeah, uh, but before, before that, is there anything else you want to talk about, about the session itself? No, it was pretty low energy session, I got this. Uh, barring the first part of the session, it was pretty low energy. Yeah. After that, like, pretty unevent, uneventful. It's pretty I'd short say. as well. But, yeah, pretty, was it short? It's three and a half hours. It's only three and a half hours. Oh, oh yeah, listen, that was only end, three hours. We ended, we ended before 12 a.m., so I guess that's, yeah, short. Sure. Never will I ever stop. There wouldn't have been much value in prolonging a session like that anyway. Um, but, you know, it's how it goes, really. Not every session is going to be all this high action, high energy, you know, uh, high drama. You know, sometimes you're going to you're gonna have a bit of a lull. But the lull makes you appreciate the high points more, I reckon. Um, yeah, you can't have high octane all the time. Yeah, you you get tired of that, and sometimes you just want to like. Sometimes I just want to do some shopping. Sometimes I just want to just talk, you know. Yeah, sometimes I just want to chill. Yeah. Okay. So we can mo- we can move on to some other topics now. I don't really have any more to add. Sorry, that was a long way of saying. I don't have anything more to say about the session. It cool. So recently, the party's been talking about doing a uh, in person session. What do you think the differences are between an online session and an in-person session? And if there's any benefits to uh, either, either way? No technical issues. Lag-free. That's the main part. That's just you. That's just you. You're the only one who lags. You're the only one who cuts out ever. We had Echo from Storm and Oasis that entire time. It was kind of annoying. Low-key kind of annoying. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, that's true. And actually, I didn't lag that bad. My internet was actually pretty good last night. I didn't go through any major spikes or anything like that. So, okay. yeah, not so bad. But pros and cons of online. One, they're missing that 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 genuine human connection, that real-life connection. Two, is it's subject to technical issues. So if stuff starts fucking up, then, like, unless you can fix it, you're going to have to deal with it, which can kind of ruined the immersion slash experience three um i guess that there's no third major point but feel free to add to that if you want i'd say pros is online is convenient yep can, it's easier to set up times because Definitely. you know people don't have to account for travel times and you know some of our parties live pretty far away from each other so not too far away where in person is not unreasonable, but you know, it's, it's enough to be somewhat inconvenient sometimes. I guess, I guess that's all I can really say regarding okay. the pros, unless you have more to add. To so, that. You, so apart from the, the genuine human connection, they're pretty much equal in every other aspect. No, they're not equal. I, I think IRL is much better and would prefer that. Any time, uh, uh, any time of online, really. Okay, I well, I personally definitely agree with that. It's a, it's a, it's it's an, a, it's a good alternative, but 
as an equal, no. It's not the real thing? Not. Yeah. It's just it's just a substitute for the real drug that is real-life d and I mean, that's how it's supposed to be played. Yeah, I, uh... I mean, convenience-wise, you can. it's also really easy to send pitches to one another. Um, it's also really easy to link things. Um, well, you can still you can still do that. I'm pretty sure everyone has their character sheets on D and D Beyond, so you can still just send stuff through the Discord anyway. That's oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, one other thing which I don't actually take advantage of is online battle maps, which we used to use for a little while, like um, Roll Twenty, but it was just so much effort, really. Yeah. If it's that's just another matter of convenience because the, the the battle maps aren't convenient and like you have to like start paying for stuff to you know start getting some good stuff and then, then again yeah. if you want to create your your own it just takes so much time right yeah it takes so much time um and it's just the 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 effort for the reward is I think sometimes just very disproportionate. Like, some committed DMs who have time on their hands or just like making the maps in general, that, you know, well and good, right? Win-win. Yeah. But for those who dick, dick around... That's me. ...with all this stuff... And the Brawl 20 map thing is not that good. Ooh. Hey, you just, insulted, good. you just insulted so many D&D &D players just now. Yeah, fuck them. Oh. Hey, okay. No, I, I feel bad for you. You gotta do online only. We got a real life party, okay? Suck on it. Shit. I mean, yeah, I definitely agree with that, which is, I think, which is why um, most of the time now we do all the battles in Theater of the Mind with just like a little reference map to kind of place yourselves. I mean, I, I know from, well, you know as well that the first maybe 20 sessions or maybe 15 sessions, we always use battle maps. Like, we always we always yeah. measured out the the squares and the feet and actual move speed and um like where where things were positioned yeah but now nowadays we're just like yeah it's in 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 the corner yeah you can reach it no you can't reach it do you think um that it, it, it's objectively worse or better doing either way uh no i think again it, it is subjective right so it really just depends on if if the DM can keep track of all the things in their mind accurately, fairly accurately, without making too many mistakes, then, and I think the players are fine with that because then you just, because the players have to rely on something, right? Because I don't think the players can keep track of everything because they're trying to figure out what they're trying to do next. At least for me, I'm like that. I'm more thinking of, okay, what am I going to do next, right? And then I have to refer to something or ask a question yeah. And then get the information that I need um, instead of trying to keep everything in my head. So if the DM can do that, perfect. I think it's fine. I have no issues, right? The one, the only good thing about battle maps is that you get to admire your minis. <laughs> yeah, I was um, going to say but that. But I, I don't have a proper mini for mine. I just use this hey, standard. Snow Elf Archer. Standard. Snow Elf Archer. I, I just use the bog standard Elf Archer um, thing. And it's not even painted. But one day I would love to print out a custom mini for snow like just to have right no i don't even care if i use it. i just want to look at it right i just want it to be there oh yeah that's gonna be that's gonna that's gonna hurt when snow dies one day and you just left with his mini yeah well i'd love to like like even go beyond hero forge right which you can make pretty good custom minis from that and they're not too expensive to get them shipped to you yeah but like you like get like a proper 3d artist to like fine-tune all the details you want on the character like storms that'd, one that'd be cool yeah man i feel bad because we know we, we used it like twice before we either stopped using battle maps entirely or just um moved to online i think i think he's just happy to have it really i think he might be in the same mindset as me like it's just a it's cool nice time. thing to have yeah it's a memento i guess okay yeah so but yeah overall Real life sessions is just superior in almost every yeah. way. So, do you prefer theater of the mind over battle map? 
No, I think equally, like, when battle maps work, like, if there was, if you didn't have to fiddle with all the other map bullshit and midis and stuff like that, like, if that's all taken care of, right, like, let's say we're critical role, right, and we have all the set pieces built for us, and, you know, we have our custom minis, then actually I might prefer battle map, because, you know, you get all the cool parts without doing all the shit parts, right? True. Um, but Theater of the Mind is... An alternative that I have no issue with. I have no issue with. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if the rest of the party would agree with that. Maybe maybe if we ever get them on as guests, we can ask them the same question. But I'm on the well, same page where I prefer Theater of the Mind as well. It's just easier to to narrate. Yeah, well, Theater of the Mind is, is easier, and that's why it's preferable. But yeah. Battle Maps is, is cooler, though, if, if, if you know all the stuff is done properly yeah which i think takes i think theater of the mind is actually more immersive in that people don't spend time like counting counting like hexes or squares or whatever because i think that really takes takes out of takes out of combat and one of the things which i'm always i'm always preaching every time we talk about combat is that i i want combat to be not a separate game from D D, right mm. where where it's it's not just this this side game. It's it's still D and D. You're still role playing throughout the whole thing, and that's definitely one of the areas where both me and I'd say the rest of the party can definitely improve in. Although we don't really do combat that much these days. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, I definitely agree with the fact that combat shouldn't be a separate entity from D and D itself. But it's there's definitely a line between a role playing episode and an episode that has combat in it. Because obviously combat has a start and end, so it's like a phase, right? So roll initiative, do your turns, and then people ask, is combat over? And you say combat's over. So that in and of itself makes it, kind of separates it a little bit. Yeah. So I don't think you can help that too much. Obviously, in an ideal world, the, 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 change would, the transition would be seamless. But uh, yeah, I just don't think you can reach that seamlessness 100%, you know? You can get pretty far, but you you probably won't get to the point where it's like... Because it's just in the nature of the game that, like, th- you need to call out those mechanics in order to, you know, do it properly. properly because yeah. there's, th- there's also another thing that, you know, be- the reason why people play, say, is combat over, because they're all aware that they have to wait until their turn to do stuff. Whereas in role-playing episodes, they just do it whenever they want to do it. Yeah, there is a diff- there is a there is a freedom in role playing episodes that isn't there in combat. Yeah, in terms definitely of- restricted in combat. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's always in my mind, it's always going to be a slightly separate thing than role playing thing. Yeah, but I wish it wasn't. That doesn't mean it suddenly becomes this gimmicky mini game, which it's not. But it it, it is it is had this it does have some separation in some form from the role playing yeah. stuff. So do you agree in that it has a detrimental effect on the role play itself? Well, no, like I'm saying, I'm saying combat is like a separate thing, but or it has a degree of separation, but that doesn't mean you can't role play because I think one of the great rulings that you make is that players can talk however much they want in combat. Yeah. We, I used to be kind of ass on that. Yeah. We used to do the, you know, players can only talk for six seconds as per the turn. Dictates, oh, they can right? only shout in like utterances or like. Yeah, 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 stuff like whatever. that. Yeah. And if you're a hard ass DM, sure you can play that, but then that just ruins the cinematic nature of combat and the role, you know, the, the actual role play part of it. Which, mm. yeah, I'm I'm fine breaking the mechanics a little bit in order to allow more role play because, yeah, it, know, it's just better. It's just better for the narrative yeah, way instead of and 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 it again it brings it. It closes the gap a little bit between the the role play and yeah. the combat. So. It's the same game. Yeah. Same game. Same people. Same game. So I wanted to talk about um. It's in my notes here. I sent them to you before the session yesterday, and the, yeah. one of the last ones is: Should the party be afraid? Fostering expectations. And I think we actually just kind of went through that. This this whole this whole um recap. Should should the party be afraid of the consequences? And I'm. I think we have reached the agreement that, yeah, they're, they're thinking about it now. Well, yeah, so. as the consequences become more real, that stuff just happens naturally, really. 
that's not anything that's not every anything you have to give a a lecture to the party about that shit just happens naturally yeah. once you actually enact out the consequences or you you know you play out the actions that happen because of what they did that's just natural that's not really there's not really much i can say on that because that's that's it happens by itself yeah i agree with that okay um it just occurred to me i was just thinking about it just now that not a lot of players actually got to roll their dice that often last session and um it's 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 par for the course when you have seven players obviously not everyone's going to have a lot of time to 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 play uh to roll dice but this this is a question to you and the other players is that is that bad is there something we can do about that are you guys okay with that i guess it's up to preference i remember just before you joined the discord call for the session maple was saying i think i overtuned my character a bit too much for combat um and he said he was fine with the amount of role play that we do and i said yeah we only do role play like every five sessions or so three or four sessions and he's like yeah i'm i'm completely cool with that it's just that now i don't i have all this shit that i don't use and uh yeah and i i said to him like you know if you if you just gave a heads up to um to albert he'd probably allow you to just you know change some stuff around if you want yeah i definitely let him change stuff to have more spells that are suited to role play and that's not saying that his current spells aren't aren't suited because i'm sure anyone could find a way to to somehow use use those in in other yeah, circumstances you use, other use than fireball combat. in a in a role-playing aspect yeah i think you could too yeah yeah okay i mean he did right or was it fire bolt that he used I forgot. He used fire bolts on the chapel. Maybe it was fireball. I can't remember. No, fireball. It was fireball. I think fireball. Cause he yeah. blew. He blew that thing to smithereens. Um, so about the dice rolls, do you, are you okay with not rolling as many dice as before? No, I don't care really. I've just bought these dice though from game traders the other day, and I got to roll them a bit, so I'm happy. Um, they just they just look cool to look at, but. Me personally, I'm not too fussed about rolling dice, although it does feel good to roll dice for the skills that your character is good at. I won't yeah, lie there. I but, agree. Um, as I'm, the number one thing that I care about the most, maybe 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 two things, is the immersion and the role play. As long as those two things are good, I'm I think I'm pretty happy. So do you think you could go a whole session without rolling dice once and I think I have. still be satisfied? I think I have. I have to actually as DM. <laughs> uh, but really, dice rolling is how you know however often you call for it. Yeah, I don't know. It's not like something you've. It's not something I think you have to force or anything like that. I think other DMs might rely on the dice a lot rather than their own role playing chops or anything like that. Um, I, th I yeah. think, yeah. I think sometimes, I, I mean, I, you just got to think really if it's appropriate or not. Obviously, it's, let's say, for example, someone that's not as charismatic um, is playing a bard who has super high charisma stats. You know, may maybe you would like, you would make them roll a bit more um, just because the, in, in the game world, the character has has the charisma that they don't. And I think it's unfair to expect that they reflect the same charisma on their, you know, their real life self, because that's just not who they are as people. So, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, my my point was that there's less just kind of opportunity now to get into those situations because there's so many players. Is that do you think that takes away from the experience? No, not really. Um, okay. I mean, more players means less spotlight. But as long as all the other players are okay with that, obviously there is a limit, like there's an upper limit, right? Where it's like, it's just too many players and it's just like, it's not going anywhere. This I feel that. Are going anywhere. But um, yeah, I think we, we're like, we're kind of, we're just overcapped. We're just overcapped right now. Like, I'm not saying we're over capacity, but we're like, we're like, yeah, we're like full to the bursting, right? There's, there's no way we're taking on another player at this point. Yeah. Because the campaign has slowed down quite a bit. But I am super glad that we 
went back to doing Axia as a weekly campaign because now the sh- the story's moving now instead of last year when we were swapping between like three campaigns or something like that. And oh sh- I hated that because it, it moves so slow. <laughs> it moves so slow. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. I can definitely see where you're coming from. But yeah, it, I think now that I think about it, yeah, the, a sense of progression is key. Like as long as it's not too slow, at least we feel that we're progressing with our goals and you know players are getting in the things that they want to do in that session um when the opportunity arises although again like the last podcast if you want to do that you, you need like if you're feeling like you're not getting it in you need to force your way in to the you know and speak up if you want to do something badly right so um again that's like the initiative of the player but i think ultimately more players less dice rolling i don't have a problem with that other players might have a different opinion but i don't because i I know it's um this isn't specific to our players but i know a lot of players just kind of play D &D because they like rolling the dice yeah yeah, they're like they just want to they just want to fight stuff and get loot or you know they just want to fight with their you know super decked out characters get cool loot, roll the dice. Yeah, I get that. Probably would turn out to be a personality clash between me and a player like that. But I get that. That's a legitimate play to, way to play. Um, yeah, I'd look down at you campaign. for that. I would look down at you if we were huh? at the same table. But uh, I acknowledge it's it's legitimate. But I would look down at you. It's a legitimate, but I would look down at you. Hey, hey they're different, different strokes. Different folks. Yeah, just because you're not my stroke, you're... you're I look down at huh? you, okay? It's not as good as mine. Mine is superior. Roleplay and immersion superior is superior, stroke. okay? Join me, my brothers, all right? Immersion brotherhood. Yeah, stroke along with Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to make a PSA. If, 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 the, if the other party members are listening right now. If you are unsatisfied with how uh, your character's going or, or how the campaign's going, please just tell me. Please just tell me. I'm too thick to figure it out from, from fucking uh, from hand gestures or or subtle, subtle, subtle moments or whatever. Just tell me. Straight up, tell me if you don't like something, and we can figure it out. We can figure it out. Please just tell me, please. Or even even if you have suggestions that you just want included, right? Yeah. Um, and you don't have to say it publicly. Just just send a DM private me. DM. Yeah, just send a private DM. Slide into my DMs. I always say shit to Albert all the time. Well, not as much now, but I remember at the very start, I was always like saying yeah. different shit. Yeah, because we're yeah. always trying to improve. Yeah, and then the more you do it, the better the campaign gets, the less you have to do it. So if you yeah. hate doing it, do it more so you do it less. True, you get me? very true. I agree. Um, a specific example of this is uh, Storm, or Lewis's character. After the session, he was like, hey, it would be cool if uh, you could give give us an actual map of the city. And I I wasn't planning on doing it, and I actually wasn't even thinking about it. But now I'm just like, oh, okay, that's something they want. I'll do it. It's it's, it's that easy. Like, I, I don't mind. Just, just tell me. Just tell me, please. 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 Yeah, well, okay. How about I throw one in as well? Yeah, hit me, hit me, hit me. I want, I definitely want to see more cultural aspects of Huria, other than like the guilds and stuff like that. Because sure. most of what we've seen is, is like pretty bog standard for a fantasy town. The smiths, shops, taverns, inns. It's a college, I guess. But like, what, what, what do you, like, how do these people live their life? What is like the, what is like the culture here? What's, what's taboo? What's not taboo? You know, do they have their own cuss words? You know, are they discriminatory against certain races? Or, you know, what are some traditions they have? Stuff like that. I, want, yeah. I just want more culture, you know. And I think I was I was trying to I was trying to ham it up when, I, when we were talking with Lewis last week about cultural stuff because yeah. there's so much potential. We're on a fucking turtle with a city slapped onto it in the desert. There's so much potential for for exotic exotic experience, exotic cultures, and things like that. I would love I would love to see more yeah, the of alien that. aspect. Yeah. Not just Denethar in the desert, you know. And I think, uh, at least the way everything is governed, or at least the way people 
um, respect each other. It, it's entirely different if you if you really look at it. I'm definitely missing the um, the whole little culture aspect, say the food or or the clothing. I think I talked about the architecture a little bit, but maybe I'll up that a bit. Maybe entertainment. Oh, entertainment's definitely going to be a big difference. Oh yeah, Ent entertainments like brothels or or hookah lounges or. Oh. If you guys ever go to the entertainment district, I'm oh, glad to go into it. I'm glad to go into it. You go to the entertainment district. Yeah, I think the party is so focused on what they're doing, they're just like giving, giving no downtime. You know. Yeah, I think I, I think I fucked up in that. Um, it's you, you guys are currently in like a always state of of having to do something that you can't take the time to just kind of go <laughs> go around the city. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's entirely your fault. I wouldn't blame you too much for that. I think there's a weird sense of urgency, which I think might just be a figment of the party's imagination. I mean, that guy did threaten to kill everybody you love. So th there's a bit of emergency, right? Urgent, yeah. Right? I guess thinking now, I would like to just like leisurely explore stuff. But yeah. Uh, definitely get in the comments if you want anything. Oh, okay. if you have any feedback. Subscribe. Uh, get in the comment, comments. Like. Turn on the notification button. Get, press get, the bell. Get, get press in the, the Discord. Bell. Get email in the us. Discord. Oh shit! I didn't check the oh, email. We, we didn't check the email. I want to check the there's, email right now. There's probably nothing in there. How dare you? We have at least one dedicated fan out there who sent us like at least thirty emails, right? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing, right? There's nothing. It's Google. It's Just Google. Did, a, did a fly come out of the screen? <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you open your wallet and the fly. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you wanted to chat about? No, I think that that was the gist of things I wanted to go into. I think that's all for today. Yeah, well, I guess we can wrap it up. Um, anyway, send us an email. Uh, Please. Join our Discord. Please comment. Please S -s -s subscribe. Please subscribe. Uh, we we only have twenty views. We only have twenty views on the last episode. Please, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Who's my ego? Okay. Um, anyway, we'll see you guys later. We're Far Kingdoms. Bye. <laughs>